rendering history at its best, a narrative that becomes a rich tapestry, telling the story of England and France at a time when they were divided, racked by violent struggles for power, and when their fortunes were intertwined through war and conquest. Jonathan Sumption's fourth volume of his History of the Hundred Years' War, that is, a last volume to come, has the short and dazzling reign of Henry V at its heart, the warrior king who was dead at 36 in 1422 when he was about to become King of France as well as England. This is history in the grand manner, painting a vivid picture of royal courts and battlefields, the struggles for the English throne and France in the grip of political chaos. Jonathan Sumption calls this volume Cursed Kings. Welcome. The Hundred Years' War is a, a phrase that trips off the tongue very easily, but as a period, I suspect, it's one that in many people's minds is extremely hazy, and until they perhaps go to a Shakespeare festival and see Henry IV, part one and two, Richard II preceding it, and then Henry V. Um, Henry V is the key figure in this volume. And just remind us what the state of England was and the state of France at this moment. England was a a relatively small but highly organized country whose wealth was uh, much more at the disposal of the state than was true in uh, some other European countries. Uh, it was a very centralized country with a long tradition of powerful government. This caused huge problems when the powerful government disappeared, you had civil war, but it also meant that at, on occasions it could uh, achieve tremendous efforts in fighting wars with countries enormously more powerful than itself, like France, which had three times the population of England in the late Middle Ages and at least three times its wealth, but whom it nevertheless defeated on two brief occasions before finally being defeated conclusively itself. And Henry V, uh, dead at 36, uh, a young man, about to become King of France at the time of his death, emerges uh, from your volume as just as extraordinary a figure as, as Shakespeare made him seem on the stage. He really was um, somebody whose, whose power to direct men was exceptional, wasn't it? Yes. Henry V had a tremendous force of personality. He had an extraordinary strategic grasp and he had the quality which is probably more important than any other in war. He had the ability to seize his opportunities, to understand what he needed to do and to exploit situations as they arose. He wore the wounds of battle, of course, on his, on his face so people could see he yes. was a warrior. Um, when he fought the climactic battle of this part of the conflict with France in 1415, how much luck was involved? How easily could it have gone the other way? Oh, it could very easily have gone the other way. The French were enormously superior uh, in numbers, particularly in cavalry. Um, and um, they, it, they lost the battle as, at least as much as the uh, English won it. They chose a site which was a disastrous place in which to fight it because it meant that the two armies were confined within uh, a relatively narrow uh, corridor between two areas of dense woodland. And the English archers had a field day. The English archers had a field day. The English archers were an arm of warfare which had no equivalent in France and undoubtedly were uh, one of the main factors behind the English success in battles, not just in Agincourt but on many other occasions during the Hundred Years' War. Um, what do you think we learn from this? What do we learn about the process that the two countries were going through in their, you know, at, at that time in history, how they were to become afterwards? Well, the main thing that we learn uh, is the different responses um, of these two countries to the experience of fighting. Uh, and this is very significant for their subsequent development. The lesson that the French learnt was that the only way uh, in which to defeat foreign invasion and maintain their national independence 
was to have a very powerful centralized monarchy um, <coughs> with unrestricted tax raising powers uh, and in a sense therefore this is the period in which the French state as it existed until the French Revolution was born. The pattern was set. Yes, and in, in important respects, as it existed after the French Revolution, and in some ways still does today. Um, the English, on the other hand, found that in order to raise money, it was actually much more productive and uh, much more suitable, much, much, a much better way of increasing the king's power to cooperate with representative institutions. Uh, and it, the Hundred Years' War, because it was a period when the English kings were very much in need of money, was the period in which Parliament uh, really began to acquire the power which it uh, was to have uh, in very large measure in later periods of English history. Which makes it sad, doesn't it, that certainly at school level the period is, relatively speaking, ignored to such an extent? Yes, I think it is sad because um, there is enormous value in studying a single society and in this country it makes sense for that society to be uh, English or at least British society um, uh, over a long period uh, and you lose a, a whole dimension of historical understanding if you only study it in little bits here and little bits there um, and unfortunately the Middle Ages has uh, lost out from that, but it was a period of uh, uh, striking personalities, extraordinarily powerful uh, national movements, uh, and a period of very exciting events, which we would do well to study, if only because of its inherent human interest. But there's a dazzling array of um, source material for this volume. You began the whole project, your history of the Hundred Years' War, I think in the late 70s. You must have spent months in French archives in all kinds of places. Um, I assume you've done most of it yourself. Do you have researchers or is I it your I don't have own? any research assistants. I've done it all myself. I write the book for pleasure, so it would be silly to delegate the pleasure to someone else. Finding small nuggets of information and documents have a curious way of representing the past. In the public record office uh, there are um, handbooks which the captain of Calais would have carried about with him uh, when on his nightly inspections. Uh, there are documents in which the clerk says it's too perishing cold to go on with this writing I'm going to bed. Um, this is they're trivial but they are wonderful these crushed leaves from the past. You're a justice of the Supreme Court. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about history. And you were a, a lawyer, a distinguished lawyer, while you began this project. How do you find the time? Well, there's, there's space in most people's life uh, for some consuming interest. Uh, it may be bell ringing, it may be Morris dancing, it may be home decorating. This is my equivalent. And when will we get the fifth and final volume? I hope in five or six years. Jonathan Sumption, thank you very much.